with super dogs. Welcome to the show. They can jump high, they almost touch the sky. So hold on tight and just watch them fly. Whoa, oh, go super dogs. Whoa, oh, go super dogs. One, two, three, four. I want to see some more. Get them on the floor so they can play some more. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us at the President's Choice Ask the Superdog Trainer questions. We're happy to have you. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, we just ask that you put them in the comments and I'm happy to answer them. We did have a couple of questions that came in before, so I'm going to start with those and uh, we've got them right up on the screen now. We get asked a lot about joining Superdogs. So we're going to start with this one right away. First question is, how old does your dog have to be in order to join Superdogs? So all of the dogs that you see in our show, those dogs are all the personal pets of the cast member that they're performing with. And they are training our dog, we're training our dogs a little bit all of the time. Um, so when people come to audition for our shows, uh, the dogs are already trained and they're trained in a variety of different disciplines, um, agility, fly ball, disc, um, frisbee freestyle, uh, regular freestyle, scent detection. These are all skills that we use in our show. So depending on the dog, your dogs are over one year when you um, start training a lot of these. And they're about a year and a half, depending on the dog, when they start performing. Some dogs uh, mentally mature uh, a little bit sooner, but physically they don't. And we don't want to put that sort of wear and tear and strain on their body. You want to make sure your dog is completely done growing. Their growth plates are closed for their safety. You want a long um, career with your with your performing dog, not a short one. So try not to be too anxious. So I would say it's anywhere from a year and a half to two years uh, before your dogs are really performing in the super dog show. But again, we're going to get them used to all sorts of things early on. Uh, Natalie asked me my favorite trick to train. Oh, I have many, many favorite tricks to train. I love training tricks because it's a great way to, way to spend time with your dog and bond. Um, when I was an obedience instructor, I taught a lot of trick training, and I think that I liked it the most because people tend not to stress about training tricks. Sometimes when we teach obedience, it's really important to us that our dogs come when called. We need our dogs to not pull us when we go for a walk. It doesn't matter for dogs know how to spin, but we like it. Uh, so I think sometimes we loosen up, we have a bit more fun with it. I think that my favorite trick to teach, um, I think because it's a fun one to show off, is to do a handstand. Uh, my Vigla Honor does a really great handstand and also a walking handstand. Um, and I think it's a bit unexpected uh, when people see it. So I think that's a fun trick to train. Um, depending on your dog's um, sort of physical build, some dogs are easier to do it than others. Uh, she was a dog that naturally had a lot of back end awareness. So she offered lifting her, her rear end a lot. So that was a trick that was easy for her to learn as well. Uh, so that was a great one. Thank you for that question. Uh, next question from Sue is should, we, oh, this is a great question. Thank you for asking this, Sue. Should we teach our dogs to be comfortable with strangers wearing masks? So now more than ever, this is a very important question. Um, given everything that's going on in our world today and how things are changing, our dogs are being exposed to people wearing masks more and more in their normal lives than they would be out on a walk, that sort of thing. But this is something that your dogs are exposed to a lot at vet clinics that we're not aware of. Uh, we often go to our vets, we are with our dogs, and we don't see sort of what happens behind the scenes. But your dogs are seeing people in masks all throughout their lives. So I would start exposing my dogs to masks. Um, this is a great time to do it. So how you would do that, if you do not know, is um, with any type of training you're doing with your dog, always try to, to break it down. Um, so rather than just flood your dog by everybody having masks on and, and over exposing your dog, you can um, start by having a mask yourself. Uh, you can allow your dog to sort of sniff it, interact with it. You can hold it up to your face, uh, just sort of over your mouth without putting it all the way on. Reward your dog for being interested in it. Um, if your dog is uncomfortable with anything in any type of training, never push them beyond their limit. Um, so I would put it on my face, hold it up, reward my dog for that. Um, and then eventually you would have, you know, people in your family do the same thing and gradually expose your dog to that. So thank you for that question. So that's a great question. Um, next question is my dog is nervous in a vehicle. Do you have any tips for helping them out? Another great question. My first recommendation would be uh, to, um, of course, confine your dog 
in a vehicle, whatever vehicle you're traveling in, whether it is in a crate, um, if you're if you don't have room in your vehicle for a crate, you could use um, a seatbelt for a dog. But that is for their safety. So start with that. Uh, be is, is a, a great rule of thumb. Dogs should be confined in vehicles. Um, if you have a dog that's really nervous in, in your vehicle, you can actually bring your dog, put them in their crate, make their crate nice and comfortable for them, start your vehicle, and actually don't go anywhere. You just want your dog to be in the car. Um, and that, again, depends on how nervous your dog is. You can even be in your driveway, backing up, backing forward, very short, short trips. Um, for many dogs, the first time that they're in a vehicle is when they leave, if they're from a breeder, they've left the breeder, um, or if they're at a shelter or humane society, if you've rescued a dog, and this is the first sort of long journey that we're expected to, or we, that we know of, and then they just leave their home, they leave where they are and they have to go on a long journey. So um, some people, if you get a dog from a breeder, the breeder will have done some work and expose them to vehicles, but don't count on that. Um, so again, putting your dog in a car, uh, in their crate, turning the car on. You can give them uh, their food in their crate. Uh, if your dog is suffering from motion sickness, that's a completely different situation that you would want to break that down as well. Um, having the fresh air on for your dogs, keeping the vehicle a little bit cooler will help for your dogs as well. Giving them something to do in their crate to occupy their time. Um, but try not to make your first journey a really long one. Uh, break it down for them as well with that. Um, and if you have a dog that's uh, really struggling, a couple of things you can look into. One's called a thunder shirt. It goes over your dog and um, helps to secure them. It's great for thunder and lightning. That's what it's named after. Uh, but good as well for dogs in cars. Um, you can get something called a static strip that hangs from the back of your vehicle. That helps as well. And if you're really um, having a dog that's really struggling and it's making it um, so that you can't travel with your pet, I would also speak with your veterinarian about anti-anxiety medication as a last resort as well. Thanks, Dan, for that question. Uh, next question is, I have a friend who has um, new puppies and are heading back to work next week. Oh, great question. Any tips to help our ease, ease puppies being left alone for longer periods of time? So I think one of the great things about COVID, if there is a great thing, is that a lot of us have been able to spend more time with our dogs than we normally get to. Uh, and our dogs, of course, are loving this extra time with us, but we are sort of setting them up uh, so that they're getting used to having us around 24 seven. And then for some dogs, as life slowly starts to return to some new normal, we're gonna get back to our different routines. So what I would do is start now, a new routine for your dog, which is there are times during the day where we're not entertaining them, where they don't have our undivided attention, where they are learning to settle uh, puppies in a crate for their safety, adult dogs on their beds um, or wherever they're being kept in the home. When you're not home, they need to learn what life is like when you're not home. So even if you are running an errand and you might normally take your dog with you, leave your dog at home. So they have to learn to spend, spend some time at home. Uh, so you wanna make sure that we're not setting our puppies up to have uh, a lot of separation anxiety because they're really enjoying that special time with us as are we, we have to start distancing ourselves just enough so that they can be coping with being left alone. Thanks very much, Devin. Next question. Uh, when my dog offers a trick that I haven't asked for and looks for a reward, what's the best way to handle this without community? Oh, that's a great question, uh, Becky. So. The more you, um, I find with my dogs, the trick that I have taught them last is the trick that they offer the most uh, or the trick that I've taught them first. Um, my Vizsla will offer to anybody the trick where they go between their legs and put your feet on anyone's paw. She offers it at the vet clinic. She offers it all the time where she shouldn't. I am always amused by it and I find it always charming. Um, but I understand that somebody else might not appreciate that that they're doing. Uh, so I would simply just redirect them back to me. Um, I don't want her to be discouraged. If they are, if you're in the middle of teaching a trick and they're offering you something that uh, you don't want, I would teach my dog a command, something like try again. Uh, so I wouldn't use the word no or uh, uh, something that says to your dog, those commands say to your dog, no, never do that again. But if you have a command like good try or a, a phrase like good try, not quite, try again, keep working, something that's quick and snappy that says to your dog, thank you for trying, but you have to keep trying. Or So it could be something like simply like try again that says to your dog, I like the effort. I'm not going to reward it, uh, but I'm not going to um, tell you no for trying because we always we want to encourage trying. Some of the things that I taught my dogs that I never anticipated trying, some of the, my favorite behaviors I've learned um, are my dog's problem solving and figuring something out. So I might start to teach my dog a trick 
And then all of a sudden, um, I have a dog that crosses his paws, uh, and I was not trying to teach that trick. And he just started to offer it. I was trying to get him to do something else. I was trying to get him to crawl. And he was, I was obviously having different timing, or he was misreading my cues. And so he started to offer his paw. And so I we started rewarding that because it was better than the trick I was trying to offer or trying to train. Thanks very much, Becky. That was a great question. A uh, question um, from somebody who lives downtown in a condo and wants to get a dog, but likes large dogs, uh, the bigger the breed, what bigger breeds would be comfortable for tighter spaces? So this is a great question. And I'm actually in the middle of shooting a video about how to pick the right breed or the right type of dog for your lifestyle. And this is one of the questions that I'm gonna be answering in, in the, my video um, is when you're looking for a dog. Size is a big factor for a lot of us. And a lot of us that live in downtown condos, we don't have a lot of space. This is a really good question. Something that's interesting though, is not all large breeds need large spaces. I think all dogs need access to places to run. I think all dogs need access to a safe off leash area, but it doesn't mean that that, that, that sort of exercise has to happen in your home. Uh, me personally, I don't want my dogs, I don't want my house to be rambunctious. I want them to be rambunctious outside. But breeds that I would consider, um, I would think if most of the sight hounds actually, uh, greyhounds um, are a large breed, but they are not particularly active outside. They do love um, to have a good run. They need access to a safe space. But in your home, I find greyhounds, um, I have a, an Ibiza hound that's similar as well as whippets, that outside they're very active, but inside they're not active at all. They're always curled up on the sofa. Um, I think that Great Danes are similar, um, some of the Mastiff breeds as well. So when you're looking for large breeds, take into account their activity levels. And those would be some breeds that I would consider. Thank you for that question. Uh, the next question is, I have a four-month-old puppy that won't stop biting. I've tried to swap out for toys, but he isn't interested. As much as I can, um, not to have, uh, yeah, this is hard, not to have your hands available, and he's getting into the ankles and biting the feet hurts so much, yes. Um, okay, so this one, this is a great question, and it is one that every dog trainer or dog owner suffers through this one. Um, I think that puppy teeth, uh, I think that they're probably one of the worst weapons out there. Um, so as much as you can, continue to be consistent with not allowing um, your dogs to nip and bite at your hands or your feet. Um, do what you're doing, which I know is frustrating because it's not exactly working, but try to redirect them. Um, sometimes when our dogs are biting our hands and our feet, um, part of what's rewarding is they get a reaction from us. So they nip at our hands and we sort of yelp and we bend, we pull our hands back or the same with our feet. Um, so when that happens, get a toy for your dog. And I would have a special toy that is not available to my dog at all time. So it's not like a toy that's laying around on the floor. I would keep it in a special spot. And when they are getting anxious or um, overly excited at that time, I would go and get the toy, bring it out and play a lot of keep away with my dog. I wanna make that toy more desirable than what they're doing. So I have to practice the behavior of playing with the toy so that I can avoid them getting into the pattern of grab grabbing and biting at my hands. Um, so you just want, you need to repeat this behavior. So have a special toy. When the dog's acting silly, go and get it. Something to also watch with puppies is I believe that all puppies have what's called the magic, I call it the magic witching hour. And so whenever I've raised any of my own dogs, I always find when they're youngsters that there is this crazy time period and it, they where they just become naughty. And so you're trying to make dinner or whatever you're doing in your home. And that's when they're under your feet and they're becoming a little bit um, biting and nipping, doing all these things. So no that, that there is a time, watch your puppy, watch their schedule, figure it out and see, is it every night around 6.30, I'm trying to make dinner and my puppy's doing this or you know, watch when that's happening and anticipate. And you can do one of two things. You can say, I know my puppy's gonna be naughty around 7.30. At 7.15, I'm, I'm going to step in and exercise my dog before then or stimulate my dog before them to burn off that steam. You can also do the exact opposite. And this is what we might wanna do now that we're training for our dogs to be left alone is I'm going to fill a Kong with something that my dog can have, some um, freeze, just freeze some uh, um, canned food and put it in the freezer and then give it to your dog. So your dog learns, even with if they're feeling anxious, that there are times where you don't get to play, put them in their crate with all of their toys, maybe with this Kong filled with their food and allow your dog just to nibble, entertain themselves, uh, maybe a blanket or a towel over their crate so that they're not uh, seeing what's happening. They're not seeing kids playing, that sort of thing. All of the things that might help your dog lie down. 
um, and settle. I use a white noise machine with my dog when I'm teaching them to settle in their crate as well. So that tends to block out the uh, background noises as well. So those are the two things you can either, um, uh, in terms of the witching hour, is to prevent it by or giving them extra opportunity to burn off some steam or giving them the skills of how to cope with having some extra energy when there isn't time for them to burn it off. Because that will happen in your life where you're not going to have a chance to always um, cater to their schedule. Sometimes our dogs have to adapt to our schedules. Thank you for that question. Oh, there's Robin from Arizona. That's a, Rob, <laughs> a friend of mine from Arizona. I have her wonderful dog, Captain Kangaroo Retro, in the show. So thank you for saying hi, Robin. Captain Kangaroo is wonderful. And of course, he misses you very much. Um, my dog won't come inside when she plays uh, and tries to um, try to catch me with any tips. Yes. Um, when you're teaching your dog to come, whether it's coming in your home, coming on for a walk, uh, coming just in the yard, that sort of thing. We have a great video that we did show on our YouTube channel that you can watch, which is teaching your dog a recall. But what's really important um, is to practice the recall is to sometimes call your dog to come, give them the reward and then let them go back out and play again. If we only call our dogs to come to end playtime, then they were, they're very clever. They will realize very quickly that we're only going to call our dogs to end playtime. So call them to come, give them a reward, whether your reward is toys or food, figure out what your dog finds uh, more valuable, and then say, okay, go play again. Um, so don't only call them in when it's time for bedtime to come from in or you need to move along. Um, I call my dogs in before dinner, let them eat their dinner, and then I let them go play again. So that allows them to come in and out with a bit of freedom so that when it is time to end, that I mean, obviously sometimes you have to call them in, they have to come in the house, but practice that all the time with your dogs uh, while they're learning the command. Um, and again, if you're having a lot of difficulty with this exercise, you can also train on a long line uh, so that they have a bit of freedom, uh, but for their safety, you can get them to come when called. Thank you very, Faith. Very, thank you very much, Faith. Um, how do I make my dog comfortable around kids? Great question, Melanie. Um, it's important for dogs to be comfortable around kids, but you also have to set your dog up for success. And bear in mind that there are there might be some dogs that you are that aren't comfortable around kids and i don't think that dogs should ever be left alone with kids um a, a, up until a certain age i think obviously if you have, you have children that you live with at home that have been raised with the dogs and are of a certain age where they can follow your direction but i think young kids and toddlers uh, and and dogs that can both be unpredictable at times should always be supervised. Uh, that is for your kid's safety and of course to keep our dog's safety and prevent our dogs from making mistakes. I think giving um, kids in the home responsibilities within reason around the dogs is important uh, so that the dogs understand that there is like a hierarchy in terms of the dogs listen to the kids the same way that they would listen to mom and dad. So giving the kids the tools um, that they can um, use when they're with the dogs as well. So the kids can be involved in meal times. The kids should be involved in helping with walks, um, with putting the dogs in the crate with puppies at bedtime, calling them in, in the backyard. Um, even in the training, if your kid is, uh, if your kids are old enough to follow those sorts of directions, that's a great way to work with children in the house. Um, if you're dealing with a dog at home and you don't have kids, that would be my situation. If you have a dog that's uncomfortable, I'm going to uh, reward my dog in this situation. I would be using food for um, ignoring the kids more so than interacting with them. So if you have a dog that's not necessarily comfortable with kids, they don't have to be, but they do have to be able to ignore kids. Um, and so you'll see in the Super Dog Show, most of those, our dogs love children, but they're able to perform around the kids because they know that they're when they're working, that their job is not to go and entertain. And I would take those same skill sets and apply it when training a dog at, at home that might not be comfortable around kids. So I would reward my dog for um, any positive interaction with children, with such kids or simply ignoring them. They don't all have to love kids. They don't all have to ha allow children to be, you know, roughhousing and climbing on them. Uh, it's perfectly okay to um, protect your dog and not allow that to happen as well. Thanks very much, Melanie. Uh, Kyla is asking if my dog does not uh, does most of his training at home, will it work outside of in the outside world? That's a good question. Or should I work in different environments? Uh, you answered the question for me, <laughs> Kyla. Yes, absolutely. Um, you want to train your dog in all sorts of environments. Um, so. I, if you have a dog that's highly excited or highly distracted, a great place to practice or to start your training is at home because your success rate will be very high. 
So with any new trait uh, behavior, I always practice it in my home, in my backyard, where I know my success rate would be higher. And then I could even progress to uh, just in the front of my yard, which means uh, it's not a completely different environment, but slightly more distracting with cars might be going by, neighbors walking by. So I'm, again, increasing the difficulty. And then I would, uh, when our parks open up, I think they're opening up next week here in Ontario, you could start practicing some of these skills in the dog parks. Um, you could go to conservation areas. Um, you could practice, I, I practice sometimes uh, training at my vet clinics as well, um, where there are distractions, but in a controlled environment um, before you're sort of taking it street ready and you're letting your dog off, off, uh, off leash, so to speak. Um, these are all of the places that you want to test. Set your dog up for success. And if any point during the training you find that your dog is becoming overwhelmed, uh, that's our cue that we've pushed our dog um, too far, too fast. We need to take a step back and make the training a little bit easier for them and for us and do your very best to end on a high note uh, on success so um i joke all the time with my dog training friends we have an expression that is oh, just one more i'm just gonna do one more and almost always you're like why did we try one more time it was perfect we try to go push your dogs a bit further and then they fail and you want to end on success so keep that in mind if you're training and it's going well check yourself and go we've done well we can always go back and try it again but i don't want to push my dog beyond their limits thank you for that question uh, Isabel is asking, what are the most hyperallergenic breeds and should I get a hyperallergenic dog? Is there really such a thing from a breeder or a shelter? Uh, nice question. Um, so depending on what you are allergic to. Uh, so most people are allergic to dander. Uh, some people are allergic to hair and some people are allergic to saliva. So um, your own family doctor would might be able to help you out figuring out what you're allergic to. I used to have a wonderful little super dog. Uh, his name was Chili Bean. He was a Mexican hairless. So he had literally no hair at all. Um, but people sometimes were still allergic to him because of his saliva. I think that that is the exception. I think that most people are allergic to hair. So you would look or for to fur, rather. Most people are allergic to dogs with fur. So you could look for a dog with hair. Um, and for example, a Yorkshire Terrier. They have hair versus fur. A Wheaton Terrier is similar. Um, and I think that... Um, I think looking for a dog from both a breeder and a shelter are good options and it depends um, on your situation and the dogs that are available at a shelter, what you might choose from. Um, a breeder for sure, you know you're going to get a purebred dog. Uh, a shelter, you might be getting a mixed breed. There's also great breed rescue groups out as well. It's another place to consider as well. Um, more than half of the dogs in our show are from shelters or humane societies. So we are big advocates of people looking for dogs there as well. Um, but that's a great question. If you know that, um, allergies is, is, is part of your um, criteria when looking for a dog it does really narrow your pool down so it allows you to look more specific uh, there are websites that can help you as well in terms of looking for dogs uh, that are needing homes as well and you can search by breed criteria as well um, and things like dogs that are hyperallergenic uh, sorry and it just occurred to me standard poodles miniature poodles and toy poodles are also great dogs for people with allergies and also I think a breed that is very very um, often overlooked uh, their poodles are very smart and quite uh, trainable and uh, make wonderful companions. Thank you for that question. Uh, counter surfing, how do I stop? Uh, so counter surfing, if you're not familiar with that term is, uh, counter surfing is um, not your dog up, uh, surfing on your counter, but certainly your dog looking for food on your counter. So um, if you have, um, if you have a dog that's doing it, um, Really, uh, at this point, you want to set your dog up for success and not give them opportunity. It's one of those behaviors that's harder to prevent. It's easier. Um, it's harder to stop once your dog has started. So you want it right from the get to prevent your dog from doing it. So even now, I have seven dogs in my home and I just don't leave things on the counter for them. I don't have um, stuff that's available to them. Um, and that rather than them getting into the habit of practicing it, I want to prevent it. So I don't think put things that are on the counter for them. If you um, catch your dog doing it, you can certainly interrupt them from doing it. Uh, and depending on your dog, you could leave a long line on them in the home so they simply don't have access. I have friends that um, their dogs just aren't even allowed in the kitchen. They have like a perimeter around their property or around their kitchen, or they have like um, like a line sort of that they establish with the dog with every time the dog goes past it, they simply just bring their dog back. The thing with teaching your dog not to counter surf or whether they're not allowed in the kitchen or your family rules, whether they're not allowed on the sofa, that thing, those sorts of things. Um, 
and, and again, every rule of family is different in terms of the rules that are appropriate for your family. You just have to be consistent. So if your dog, you allow them in the kitchen and they get a piece of bread off of the counter, that one time that they've sort of gotten away with it, it does away with all of our training of trying to prevent it. So you have to be consistent every single time uh, to interrupt that behavior. So it just prevent them to, it from happening. Prevention is, what is that expression? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That's that's my answer to that one. Um, I did want to answer, I did have a question before about um, clipping your dog's nails. And I did want to make sure that I answered that because it was uh, asked over the, um, over the email before. So I brought in a couple of props that I wanted to show you for clipping dog's nails. Um, a lot of us are, are um, anxious about clipping our dog's nails, and I think that is because of a lot of our dogs are anxious about having their nails clipped so that we think it's a, a double-edged sword. It feeds off of us. It goes both ways. So I'm going to show you a couple of tools that I brought in um, to show you to help clip your dog's nails, and you can pick your poison, so to speak, and I shouldn't say poison, but um, so there's different types of nail clippers that are available, um, and this question came in today, and it was funny, this morning I clipped seven, I have seven dogs, and I clipped everybody's nails uh, before I came to the office today, so it was on my mind, so depending on the size of your dog, if you have a Chihuahua, a Great Dane, a Labrador, these are, everybody's, the clippers are all different sizes, so you need to pick one first that's right for your dog's nails, you don't want to have um, a very small clipper, and your dog's nails be very large, um, there's also something that's called a Dremel, which I have as well. If you're looking for a Dremel of your own, I bought one that has an update to plug in, which I would not do again because it means I have to be near an outlet. So if you're looking for one, uh, get a cordless one. I made that mistake. Um, now, if you're not super comfortable with clipping your dog's nails, the Dremel would be sort of what you graduate into. It wouldn't be your first tool. Um, I've also chosen, this is the clipper I use for my dog's nails, and I like this one because it's similar to clipping, um, like to using scissors. There's a style as well that's called a guillotine, which sounds just like it is, the clipper will come, the blade will come straight down. I find that more cumbersome for me. I prefer this because it's a little bit easier for me to see on either side of my dog's nails. Um, so to start when you're getting your dog's nails trimmed, uh, my advice is not to try and clip all of your dog's toes the first night. Um, it, it, one of the things that, that we do is it becomes stressful for us and it becomes stressful for our dogs. Um, and so sometimes people let their dog's nails grow very, very long because they avoid it. And then the problem is the quick, which is the part that is tender in the nail that if you cut it, that will hurt. It's similar to our nail. Um, that continues to grow. So if your dog's nails are very long, it means that the quick is very long and you're limited to how much you can cut off. So you want to break this down. You want to start by simply with your dog, whether you've adopted your, an adult dog or you've got a puppy at home, you want to do a lot of hand puppy or paw massages for your dog. So you're simply rubbing your dog's uh, paw, you're rewarding them for this, you can be giving them treats or you can actually have them chewing on a toy, a bone or a conch, something that's sort of occupying them. So the fact that you're handling their paw is almost, um, they're, they're not even acknowledging it. It's not really relevant to them. They're enjoying their toy, but you're uh, in the middle of this feeling their paw, rubbing between their pads, even putting pressure on each individual toenail. Uh, then you would get your clippers out. You would expose them to the clipper, allow them to sniff it to see what it is. Um, and then I would do the similar exercise with the nails where I'm tapping the clicker or the clipper to each of their toenails. I would make the sound by their ears so they hear this sound, touching their nails. And then I would maybe clip one nail, a sliver of a piece of nail, treat my dog and stop. I would do that all of the time and practice this when your dogs don't necessarily need their nails clipped so that you're like, you're not worried that they need their nails clipped but you can do all of this desensitization. You can certainly take your dog to a vet uh, or a groomer to do this, but it is a skill that you can learn on your own. Um, but to break it down and make it easy um, for your dog practice a little bit all the time. Uh, and I think that uh, you will gain confidence in that. So thank you uh, uh, to Phil who asked me that question as well and sent it in. Uh, how do I stop my dog from barking at everything outside of the window? Uh, that question is similar <laughs> to how do I get my dog to, to stop counter serving, which is you really have to prevent it. Um, dogs ha that have access to looking out the window, and I, I mean, dogs love to, to explore and look out the window and watch the neighbors, and my one dog loves to watch for squirrels, but it is very self-rewarding. So and behaviors that are re, um, rewarding will be repeated. And so just because we're not re rewarding them doesn't mean that they don't find 
that behavior um, rewarding, if that makes sense, that we're not rewarding them for it, but they're certainly rewarding themselves. So I simply would not allow my dog access to a window where I think that they're going to bark. Um, and that's really important when you're not home. So if you're home, um, you can certainly take your, a lot of dogs will look, stand on the back of the sofa to look out of the window. You can simply redirect them, give them something to do so that they have, a, so that you know not constantly interrupting them, um, but simply prevent it from happening and especially prevent it from happening when you're not able to supervise them. Um, wow, that is eight o'clock already, guys. That went by very fast. Thank you very much for asking, um, sending in all of your questions. I really appreciate it. Um, we're going to, of course, do this again. So if you have any questions, you can always send them out in, to us in advance. Please watch our schedule uh, and we'll let you know when our next live is going to happen. Uh, thanks again. We always want you to stay well and stay safe. And of course, love your dog, play with your dog and communicate with your dog. See you next time.